This is the first part in a three-part series about polysomnography. This talk is intended for the Niklaus Children's Hospital Neurophysiology Fellows. It deals with parameters and technical issues. It will be conducted in a question and answer format. The first question is, which of the following parameters is optional when recording a polysomnogram? A. Total recording time. B. Total sleep time. C. Wake after sleep onset. D. None of the above. The parameters monitored during polysomnography and so reported can be considered recommended when reporting them is obligatory, optional where reporting them is left at the discretion of the neurophysiologist, and acceptable, acceptable refers to good alternatives to recommended parameters. A polysomnogram in most patients starts when the technician, while turning off the light, asks the patient to go to sleep and ends when the technician, while turning on the light, asks the patient to get up. This period from light out to light on is called the total recording time. The total recording time must be stated in the polysonographic report. Not all the time the polysomnogram is being recorded, the patient is asleep, as can be seen in this hypnogram. In this frame, I have represented with yellow lines the times and duration of the wake-up periods between light off and light on, as you can see. I have done so to highlight the difference between the time sleep and the time awake during the study. The time the patient is asleep between the light off and the light on is called the total sleep time. Total sleep time is calculated by subtracting the total wake time from the total recording time. Two other must be reported parameters in polysomnography relates to wakefulness. They are sleep latency and wake after sleep onset. Sleep latency refers to the time it takes to fall asleep. It is scored in minutes from light out to the first sleep stage. That is to stage N1, N2, N3 or REM. This hypnogram reflects a sleep latency going from light out to N1. In this one, it is from light out to N2. And in this one, from light out to REM. Sleep latency is also a term that must be reported in every polysomnographic study. The next term I like to mention, which also needs reporting, is wake after sleep onset. It consists of the wake time after sleep is achieved for the first time until light out. Wake after sleep onset is calculated by subtracting from the total recording time, the total sleep time, and the sleep latency. 
Another useful parameter that re reflects the sleep awake relation is the percent of sleep efficiency. This parameter is calculated by dividing the total sleep by the total recording time and multiplying the product of this division by 100. I think that in the 2.4 version of the AASM manual, the parenthesis was misplaced. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. REM latency is the time from A. Light out to REM B. Beginning of N1 to REM C. Beginning of the first sleep period to REM D. None of the above. The term REM latency or stage REM latency refers to minutes scored from the beginning of the first sleep period to the beginning of REM sleep. In this case, REM latency is scored from the beginning of N1. In this case, since the first sleep stage achieved was N2, sleep latency is scored from N2 to the beginning of REM. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. Which of the following parameters is optional when recording a polysomnogram? A. Time in each stage. B. Percentage of total sleep time in each stage. C. Wake after sleep onset. D. None of the above. The current recommendations are that the time spent in each stage be reported, as well as the percentage of total sleep time in each stage. Another parameter that should be reported is the wake after sleep onset. So the answer to this question is Next question. Which of the following parameters is optional when recording a polysomnogram? A. Apnea index. B. Hypomnea index. C. Apnea. Hypoapnea index. D. Number of respiratory effort related arousal. Apnea index is calculated by multiplying the number of apneas by 60 and dividing it by the total sleep time. The apnea index is given in apneas per hour. This parameter needs to be reported. Hypoapnea index follows the same calculations but with hypoapneas. This parameter is also recommended. The apnea hypopnea index is calculated by adding apneas and hypopneas in the numerator and then executing a division in similar fashion. This parameter should also be reported. The respiratory effort related arousal index follows the same methodology but this parameter is optional so the answer to this question is D next question which of the following parameters should be reported in children but is optional for adults a occurrence of hypoventilation B. Hypopnea index. C. 
apnea hypopnea index d giant stock breathing the 2.4 aasm manual recommends reporting the occurrence of hypoventilation in children but it lists the same item as optional in adults so the answer to this question is a next question which of the following display features is not required a 15 inch screen size or more b 1600 pixel horizontal and 1050 pixels vertical resolution c time scale from entire night to a five second window d page automatic turning and scrolling it is recommended that the screen of the computer be at least 15 inch wide that the resolution be 1600 pixels horizontally and 1050 pixels vertically the equipment must have the capability to display the whole night recording as we see in this frame and to display five seconds of recording occupying the whole screen so the answer to this question is D next question just before light out the patient should be asked to do all of the following except a hold breath for 10 seconds b breathe through the nose only for 10 seconds c breathe through the mouth only for 10 seconds d take a deep breath and exhale slowly for 10 seconds As a rule of thumb, all you think that may cause confusion when reading a polysomnogram, if it were to happen during the recording, you should have the patient do. That is do before the recording. When you start, when you put the, the cables and just before you go to make it light out, you should ask the patient to do as many things as you think the patient will do during the recording and you may find difficulty interpreting them. The recommendations in this frame are obvious for those that can follow commands. The arrow points to optional. This, as we have mentioned, implies that the decision to do it or not depends on the neurophysiologist heading the lab. As you can see, asking the patient to take a deep breath and exhale slowly, that is prolonged expiration for 10 seconds, is optional. So the answer to this question is D. Next question, which of the following statements is not true regarding normal adult polysomnogram values? A, a sleep latency is 15 to 20 minutes. B, R stage constitute 25% of the total sleep time. C, most REM sleep occurs during the first half of the night. D, R stage latency is 90 minutes. 
As you can see in this normal hypnogram of an adult sleep, sleep latency is from 15 to 20 minutes and the first stage of sleep is N1. REM stage onset is about 90 minutes. The percentage of time spent in each stage is calculated by dividing the time in each stage by the total sleep time and then multiplying the product of the division by 100. The normal amount of REM sleep is 25% of the tot of the total sleep in a in an adult the total amount of n1 is 5% 50% for n2 20% for n3 and the normal sleep efficiency is between 90 and 95 percent. The amount of REM sleep is in this graph reflected by the width of the yellow bars. As you can see, these bars are wider during the second half of the night than during the first half of the night. During the first half of the night, Slow sleep is more prominent. Slow sleep referring to N3 stage. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. Which of the following stages decreases the most during life? A, N1, B, N2, C, N3, D, REM. This chart depicts the percentage of several sleep parameters by age starting at two years of age. The white line on top represents sleep latency. Sleep latency increases some late in life, but not all that much. What significantly increases as time goes by is the percentage of time awake after sleep onset. REM sleep is pretty much the same after the second year of, of age, but some decline occurred late in life. A stage N3 really drops with age, as you can see in this graph. Stage 2 has variation, but more or less it stays about the same. Stage 1 is increased early and also late in life. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. The first night effect includes all of the following except A. Reduce sleep efficiency B. Prolong sleep latency C. Decrease REM latency D. Decrease percentage of REM and N3 This is a normal hypnogram. It has the normal values corresponding to an adult. In this frame, I have removed all those values and also dim the contour of the normal histogram in order to superimpose a new hypnogram. This hypnogram has the characteristic, perhaps a little exaggerated, of 
the first night effect, which refers to the first night a polysomnogram is conducted. I will go through the specifics one by one in order to understand this important first night effect. A sleep latency increases. REM latency also increases. Wake time increases, especially wake after sleep onset time. REM stage duration decreases. N1 increases. N2 increases. N3 decreases. And a sleep efficiency also drops, going from about 95% normally to 85 to 90% during the first night. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. The recommended high frequency filter setting for EMG during polysomnography is dash hertz A35, B70, C100, D0.3. The EEG and the extraocular movement recording in polysomnography is usually reviewed using a low frequency filter of 0.3 Hz, a high frequency filter of 35 Hz, and a sensitivity of 5 microvolts per millimeter. This frame shows a filter diagram which I hope that you have reviewed before in one of our previous talk. I have added the contour of the low frequency filter and high frequency filter used to review the EEG channel in the polysomnogram. The low frequency filter setting is set at 0.3 Hz. The high frequency filter setting is set at 35 Hz. Now, I'd like you to notice that I have changed the upper portion of the frame in order to express that when doing regular EEG, the setting is different. In regular EEG, the low frequency filter is placed at 1 Hz, and the high frequency filter at 70 Hertz. In this frame, I have gone back to the settings used for polysomnography. As you can see, the filters in EEG polysomnography favors a slow wave at the expense of fast waves. Leg EMG low frequency filter is set at 10 high frequency filter at 100 Hertz and sensitivity at 5 microvolts per millimeter. For Sheen EMG, the settings are the same except that the sensitivity is lower. Instead of being 5 as it is for the leg EMG, it is 2 microvolt per millimeter. Such filter arrangement for the leg and for the sheen aim at stabilizing the baseline and recording fast muscle action potentials. EKG is recorded using a low frequency filter of 0.3 Hz and a high frequency filter of 70 Hz. 
airflow is recorded using a low frequency filter of 0.1 Hz and a high frequency filter of 15 Hz. Chest and abdominal effort is, moni is monitored by using filters in the following range. The low frequency filter is set at 0.1 Hz and the high frequency filter at 15 Hz. Nasal pressure should be recorded using either direct current or alternating co current with a low frequency filter of 0 0.03 and a high frequency filter of 100 Hz. Similar filters should be used for oxygen saturation. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. The recommended sensitivity for Shin EMG during polysomnography is dash microvolt per millimeter. A5, B2, C75, D50. The recommended sensitivity should be in the range of two microvolts per millimeter as we have just previously mentioned. Yet, most of the time, the best approach is to adjust Chini and G sensitivity and at time Chin electrode location to yield an amplitude of two millimeters while awake, at rest, and to place them and filter them in such a way that during grinding the teeth the amplitude of the signal doubles. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. The recommended maximum electrode impedance should be dash ohm A 5000 B, 2000, C, 1000, D, 100. The recommended maximum electrode impedance should be 5000 ohms. It is also important that the inter-electrode impedance difference be kept to less than 20%. To remember that if the impedance is too low, we must consider the possibility of salt bridge between electrodes. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. The recommended minimum amplitude digital should be dash bits. A9, B12, C11, D14. 12 bits would yield 4096 amplitude points or bins for each sample. More on the subject of bits and digitalization can be found on the talk about machine and safety in this YouTube channel. So the answer for this question is B. Next question. A desirable sampling rate of 500 Hertz is recommended for all of the following except for A. Snoring sounds. B. Esophageal pressure. C. EEG. D. ECG. A desirable sampling rate of 500 hertz with a minimum of 200 hertz is recommended for EEG, EOG, EMG, ECG, and snoring sounds. A desirable sampling rate of 100 hertz and a minimum of 25 Hz 
is recommended for airflow, nasal pressure, esophageal pressure, rib cage and abdominal movements. A desirable sampling rate of 25 Hz with a minimum of 10 Hz is recommended for O2 and PCO2 saturation. A desirable sampling rate of 1 as well as a minimal sampling rate of 1 Hz is recommended for body position. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Which of the following montage is recommended for polysomnography? A or B? A limited number of electrodes are shown in this frame. They represent the minimum electrode used for regular EEG. The minimum electrodes placed for adult polysom polysomnography to monitor the brain is 8. And they are preferred from one hemisphere to the opposite mastoid. The not used electrodes are backups to be used if there is a problem with the initial montage. An alternative montage is to connect FC to CC, CC to OZ, and C4 to M1, leaving all other electrodes not connected for the possibility of a complication. So the answer to this question is a. Next question. In patients from 2 months to 2 years of age, bilateral central recording to detect spindles is optional. A true, B false. For infants and young children less than 2 years of age, since spindles are often asymmetrical, an optional electrode placement consists of monitoring both hemispheres, as you can see in this frame. Or, at times, having C4 referred to CC as well as C3 referred to CT. For an in-depth discussion about the ontogenesis of spindles, you may go to Pediatric EEG, which is one of the talks in this channel. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. Which of the following montage is recommended for polysomnography? A or B? Electrodes for eye monitoring in the adult should be placed one centimeter below or above one centimeter lateral to the other cancers. In children, instead of using one centimeter, we use the measurement of half centimeters, but place them exactly in the same arrangement. I have introduced in this frame the two eye movement montage that I have just mentioned. On the lower left corner of this frame I have placed an eye with positive signs going forward. This is reflecting the positivity that occurs between the cornea and the retina the positivity being on the side of the cornea. When looking up and using the mastoid reference, 
and out of phase div divergent tracing will occur in the eyelids, where if we use the FC reference montage, the deviation will occur in phase in going up. When looking down, an out of phase deviation, this time towards each other, will occur in the eye montage using the mastoid as a reference, whereas when using FC as a reference, the deviation will be in phase, this time going down. When looking to the left side, out of phase deviation will be present with both montage. It would be divergent when using the master reference and towards each other when using the FC reference. When looking to the right, the tracing in both montage would be out of phase. When using the mastoid reference, they would be towards each other. When using the frontal reference, they would be away from each other. This frame summarizes the finding produced by different eye movements with different montage. Now I have added the brain to this frame. And under the wave generated by the brain. Notice that they are always in phase. The fact that the eye montage using the mastoid as a reference and one lead above and one below the side of the eye produces always out of phase deviation makes distinguishing eye movement from brain activity very easy. So the answer to this question is A. Which of the following montage capture more eye movements? A, OD, and OS, below and lateral to FC, B, OD, below and lateral, and OS, above and lateral to M2. D, none. Using the frontal electrodes as reference and both eyes electrode below the eyeball, we can analyze eye movements in all directions. And they yield significant amplitude deviation regardless of the direction of the eye movements. Blinking is also easily noted. Using mastoid as a reference and one electrode above and another one below the side of the eyeball, we can also analyze all eye movements, but some eye movements will be detected better than others, making a small eye movements very difficult to, to detect or undetectable. And blinking may also be missed. So the answer to this question is A. Next question, how many electrodes should be used for the purpose of monitoring chin EMG? A2, B3, C4, D5. This frame represents a cut through the base of the tongue going through the ioid bone. As you can see, the different muscles are labeled. The muscle that contributes the most to chin muscle tone and therefore to chin EMG 
is the mielo ioid muscle. This figure shows the relation of the electrodes and the jaw bone used for chin monitoring. Chin Z is placed one centimeter above the inferior edge of the chin at the midline. Chin 1 and chin 2 are left and right chin electrodes. They are placed two centimeters below or back to the inferior edge of the chin and two centimeters from the midline. In children, most of the time, instead of using two centimeters, we use one centimeter in all directions. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. For monitoring leg movements, the surface electrode should be placed in the middle of the dash muscle. A. Extensor digitorum longus. B. Extensor hallucis longus. C. Tibialis anterior. D. Extensor digitorum brevis. The muscle most often monitored in leg movement is the tibialis anterior. The electrodes are placed in the belly of the muscle about two to three centimeters from each other. So the answer for this question is C. For monitoring arm movements, the surface electrodes should be placed in the middle of the dash muscle. A. Flexor digitorum profundus. B. Flexor digitorum superficialis. C. Pronator teres. D. Flexor carpi ulnaris. Arm movements are usually recorded from the flexor digitorum muscle. The electrodes are placed between the upper and the middle third of the forearm in, on the ulnar side. The electrodes are placed two to three centimeters from each other. Another option when monitoring arm movements is to place the electrodes in the belly of the extensor digitorum communis. Again, they are placed two to three centimeters from each other in the belly of that muscle. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Infant sleep scoring rules apply from dash weeks conceptual age. A 37 to 48, B 25 to 48, C 34 to 44, D 33 to 52. The manual recommends that this montage and monitoring will, as well as the rules, will be used for full term until two months of age. For further discussion, please, l you can see and hear the YouTube video entitled Neonatal EEG. So the answer to this question is a. Next question. How long is non-REM REM cycle? A. 60 minutes. B. 90 minutes. C. 120 minutes. D. 140 minutes. The average non-REM REM cycle is about 90 to 110 minutes. The first of the cycle tend to be shorter lasting from 70 to 100 minutes. After the first cycle, the average is about 90 to 120 minutes. The non-REM REM cycle in neonates is 50 to 60 minutes long. So the answer to this question is B. 
Next question. Termeter and thermocouple yield a quantitative assessment of airflow. A true, B false. Thermistor uses small current created by a battery and a temperature dependent resistor to assess airflow. Thermocouples are more stable. They use a small current created when two dissimilar metals are placed in a circuit and a temperature dependent resistor. Most thermocouples used in a sleep are composed of either chrome or copper attached to constantan. The advantage of these methods over other methods to monitor airflow is that they simultaneously measure oral and nasal flow. The disadvantage of these methods are that the measurement is qualitative and not quantitative and therefore some hypo hypopneas may be missed. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Nasal pressure monitoring devices yield a quantitative assessment of airflow. A true, B false. Nasal pressure devices do not monitor mouth breathing, but they provide a semi-quantitative assessment of airflow. They are recommended for the detection of hypopneas. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. N tidal CO2 monitoring devices are best used to measure airflow. A true, B false. N tidal CO2 monitoring measures CO2 but not airflow. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Respiratory inductance flexismography derives tidal volume from changes in inductance of coils. A true, B false. Respiratory inductance Flatismography derives tidal volume from changes in the inductance of the coils that are inside the band. They can be used to assess chest and abdominal breathing. They can also be used to some the abdominal and chest circumference and monitor them independently. Please take a few seconds to look at this table and look at the benefit of each of these different type of respiratory monitoring devices. So the answer to this question is Next question. Which of the following gadget is used in CPAP studies? A. Thermistor. B. Thermocouple. C. Flexismography. D. Nemo tachometer. Nemo tachometers are used to assess airflow by measuring pressure differences across a known resistance. It is used during CPAP studies. This figure has two different type of devices used for CPAP. The figure on your right shows an equipment set up to deliver low flow rate by mask. 
higher airflow must be delivered by cannula. Both devices have a, a flemo tachograph incorporated in them. Nasal mask pneumo tachometer can also be used in the evaluation of neonates with breathing problems, but their use is cumbersome and in most instances temperature devices suffice. So the answer to this question is D. Thank you.